Hello grunts. Let's talk about timepieces. This is the Garmin Instinct Solar 2. Let's go. Some people use them to look cool. It's an accessory. Most people like us use them as a functional piece of equipment. I have never been a big watch guy. I never wore them until I came in the military and then I just bought the cheap old Timex things. Would put the little Velcro strap on there and that's all I needed. Once we went to smartphones, in many cases, I never even freaking wore one. Although most of us are not really navigating with this, we'll get to that later, it is handy to be able to pull up a grid in an instant. And then if you're into fitness and everything, it's pretty nice to track your workouts and actually see progress. So let's get to the good, bad, and the ugly. So my experience with the Garmin watches is the Tactics Bravo. It's one of the original models. Doesn't have maps on it, and I was okay with that because again, I never learned to navigate with these. I would just use things like this to pull up a grid because as it turns out, if you're walking around the woods trying to navigate with this and follow an actual course, they're not 100% accurate. You're also kind of losing security. So I learned how to navigate the old school way, and then it was handy to just pull this out and double check my grid. Or if I did get turned around and couldn't find myself on the map, well, pull it up, get a grid, plot that on the map. Now you know where you are. All right, so let's talk about options. Instead of the Tactics Bravo, the Instinct is a little more sporty. So there's a lot more different color choices. I've got the Coyote Brown, Coyote Tan. It's a lot lighter than that. It's probably one of the lightest smartwatches I've ever seen. It's not touchscreen because as it turns out, solar and touchscreen, we haven't figured out that technology yet. That's why you won't see these Apple Touch watches that are also solar. Maybe one day it'll be cool, but we don't have it yet. This is extremely comfortable. The strap has all these holes in it. So you get a lot more breathability. It's unlike the heavy nylon straps you usually get with these watches. It's a lot breathable and it's a little more stretchy, which is important because you put it on in a cold morning, you gotta put it on nice and tight. Once you start moving around, your wrist is going to expand. So it's nice to not have to adjust the freaking watch all day. This is kind of a picky thing, but there is a little lip inside this part that actually retains that. So you don't have this big old thing flopping around. Now you can cut these, but sometimes I like to mount my watches on something else. So I like to keep that strap a little bit longer, but it has a retention system right here. So that doesn't go anywhere. Small feature, but makes a big difference for me. Well, it's, uh, it's warming up. All right. Now up front, we're gonna get to what I think most of you guys want to know about. Does the solar function work? I was skeptical, most people are skeptical. I've seen some complaints and guys, I'm happy with it. Yeah, you have to be out in the sun and it has to get a lot of direct sunlight. Right up there at the top, you can see they measure the life by days. So based off of that measurement, I would run my tests and leave it out in direct sun like this. And as long as it stayed out there, it was about every two, maybe two and a half hours, I would gain a day on the lifespan of the watch. So as you can see, mine says 19 days. Okay, so think about that. You're definitely going to have to be out in the sun a lot. What's worked so far for me is I would keep it charged. Maybe once a week, I would plug it in overnight. It would get a full charge. The highest I've seen the lifespan go for me was 29 days. I haven't gotten over that. But if you are charging it, frequently maybe every couple nights or something it'll never run out and then if you go on like a longer week trip or something you should be good to go but i'll tell you a trick up front you can actually put it in stealth mode which shuts a lot of things off that saves your battery and you'll actually get a hell of a lot more time out of that so not having to charge it every night that's very handy because i have been on longer trips where i didn't bring a charger didn't think about it didn't even care charge it up before the trip and I come back home a week or two later, 
no problems. Between stealth mode and the sun, it does get, it'll last. Of course, you can't connect to your phone and all that while it's in stealth mode. But one thing, you've got your heart rate sensor. You might be able to see it blinking. That shows up in night vision. So if you're putting this in stealth mode, thinking that's not going to be seen, well, you're wrong. You're going to have to put it in night vision mode or you're gonna to have to manually go turn off that heart rate sensor. Something for the truly tactical guys to think about. Stealth mode does not eliminate all the light. And in stealth mode, you're not gonna see it because it's daytime. In stealth mode, you can still activate this light. So kind of a bad deal if you accidentally press it. That's why we wear Nomex gloves that come up over the wrist and cover our watches. Or we do the old school method of putting duct tape over it and then we can just peel it off whenever we want. Most people don't have to worry about this, but if you're in a tactical situation and your watch is exposed, that is some glare right there. You will be seen. So maybe 0.01% of the population have to worry about that. But if you're in a tactical setting, something to consider. I've been hitting the head too many times, so we're just going to go down the list of stuff. It's silly, but one of my favorite things about this is you can do multiple timers. You can just keep adding timers. You can run them all simultaneously. So I use it when I'm cooking, deadlines I got to meet, other reminders. I can just set all these freaking timers and we're good to go. I think that's cool. The older Garmin watches couldn't do that. You had one timer. And with the timers, while you're already running a workout, you can also run other timers. So if you're doing like HIT workouts and stuff and you don't want to use their HIT clock, that's pretty cool, man. All right, so I did notice that it acquires satellites a lot faster than at least my Bravo did. And it's also just a little bit more accurate, but I, I have tracks that I run on where I know the distance. And so if I was going to do a three mile run, it will always be just a little bit short, maybe about 500 feet short. So not too bad, but if you are trying to be exacto with runs and distances, just know that, of course, we got to talk to satellites, man. It's not going to be perfect. Another thing they added is your suggested workout. So if you pull up run, which is the only time I've seen it, it'll actually give you a suggestion for your run. And it's going to be based on all the other data it has acquired. It's not perfect, but I've noticed when I do feel like I'm not as recovered, the suggested workout, it'll actually make a little bit more sense. It won't be such a tough run. Also, if this thing thinks I'm drained, especially because I don't wear it when I sleep, so it doesn't count my sleep, it'll actually tell me that I should take a break. And if I do an intense hit workout or a really long, tough ruck, it'll actually tell me the recovery time. So it'll estimate it off all this data and nerd stuff, and it'll say, yeah, you need like 40 something hours to recover from this workout. So then the next day when I plug in a run, because yeah, I will do light runs after tough workouts, It'll either tell me to take a break or it'll suggest something very light. So for the hardcore guys who kind of forget recovery, that might be a good reminder. You can also just skip right past that if you don't care about their suggestions. Now, as far as the app goes, it is the Garmin Connect. It's always been a little finicky. So I don't really get into the app too much except maybe just to upload the workouts I've done. I usually forget, so it'll be a monthly thing and then all of a sudden it populates all these freaking workouts. Plugging in GPX files, so if you're going, if you're planning a long hike or an expedition, you can find the GPX file online. You've got to be on your computer. That kind of sucks. Then you can send it to your Garmin account. The next time you connect your watch, it'll put those files and that route and everything into your watch. And for years of using that, that's the one thing that I could totally depend on with the Garmin like apps and functionality and all that. I was never out on a hike that I pre-planned with a GPX file and it, I got turned around. Now, of course, with the satellite connectivity issue, if you're under heavy canopy, yeah, it's gonna show you off course a little bit, but you keep moving, you get back into the open and it picks right back up. It does give you a warning if you're pretty far off course. That's kind of cool. All right, let's talk about the Sight & Go feature. It's kind of something a lot of people were happy about. Sight & Go is basically Let's say you're on a hilltop and you're looking out at another hilltop or a road you want to get to. You pull up the sight and go and you basically point your watch at it and that gives you a bearing. Okay, so I've noticed some inexperienced people, they will discuss that feature as if it's like a navigation. Okay, but think about this. If I'm on this hilltop 
and I see another hilltop two kilometers that way, and I want to get to that, the watch can only give me the bearing to it. And so I get down into a valley, and I'm taking gulches and all these other depressions and elevations trying to get there. All the watch can do is show me if I'm off course or not. So we haven't been able to measure the elevation of the new point or any other terrain features. So something to think about, it's a cool feature because if you don't know the azimuth or the bearing that you should be taking to that point, you can get that bearing. Another thing, you can put in distances, but I haven't been able to get under a certain amount. So I think it was 50 miles or something like that. Maybe it's a glitch in mine, but it was kind of bothering me where I would try to sight and go to something and I couldn't even change the distance. Okay, so what you're telling me is you're only gonna give me a course to something 50 miles away. Kind of strange. But either way, the sight and go is handy if you just need a bearing to something, but basic navigation, you're, you're gonna figure out everything else in between. Okay, another thing they added is the expedition feature. So if you're going on really long hiking trips like backpackers or you're just out here and you want to save battery power, pretty cool function because you can tell it to update every 30 minutes, every hour or something. It'll grab your most recent position at that time. It saves a ton of battery. You can put it in expedition mode and pff, you might get months of battery life. My problem with that is... Putting it in expedition mode limits a lot of the other functionalities. So you can't do workouts while that's running. It's hard to plot coordinates and it's hard to function the watch while you're in expedition mode. So it almost seems like expedition mode is great if you are just out there moving and you're not using all the other functionalities and that's all you want to do is track your positions every half hour to an hour or even every six hours if you want to. But you have to know that once you're in expedition mode, you're kind of stuck in that mode and you're not going to get into anything else and your functionality is heavily limited. You can customize the face. You can, you can customize every single workout. You can create workouts. You can make your own. I changed hiking to rucking and changed a lot of features. The workout screens you can change. You can add data screens and then you can actually edit each data screen. So being able to edit stuff on this watch is awesome. There's only a couple things I changed. I wanted the elevation on the front screen and the sun and moon rise I wanted on the bottom of the screen. Other than that, I didn't have to do much, but you can change every single field. So you see how I've got mine set up. You know, we got elevation, time, date, um, sunrise, moonrise, and our battery power. You can change every one of those fields every single one you can add or remove you can it's it's really cool so, and of course with any tactical watch especially garmin you're going to have the jump master mode all the joes thought that was so cool and that was one of the main reasons they bought it well you got to get this because it has jump mode like okay i'll tell you this guys uh, i've jumped out of planes and very few people actually use that your jump masters don't even use it if you're sitting there as a jumper and you're just curious about stuff you could put it in the jump master mode and have some fun with it, but let's think about this. Is the U.S. military, especially any elite unit, are they going to depend where to drop guys solely on a freaking watch? No, because we have so much other great technology and skills that we can use to know what the hell we're doing. All right, let's get through some negatives. So the body battery, which kind of measures your recovery, your sleep, and all that stuff, even if you set your sleep time, it's not going to assume you slept during that. You actually have to wear it so it can measure your heart rate while you're sleeping. And I don't wear watches when I sleep. I absolutely cannot stand it. You know, I did a few times just to see if the body battery thing actually worked. It does, but you better wear that watch all the time. Mm -hmm. So I should be able to put in like, hey, I slept six hours or seven hours or put in that sleep schedule that they ask for in the beginning and it just kind of estimates based on the amount of sleep. I get it, it's nerdy tech stuff, you know, but it's kind of useless to me because I don't sleep with the watch on. Um, another thing, when you first program it, it's gonna ask like your daily schedule, your wake time, your sleep time. I have not found a way to turn that off. So I put it in for like getting up at 5.30 in the morning. Whenever I get up at three or four in the morning, 
it's hard as hell for me to figure out how the hell to get out of the sleep mode. I have to push all kinds of buttons and go into settings and it should be easier to just shut sleep mode off. So if you're in sleep mode, I haven't been able to find a quick setting to just shut it off. Around my wake up time, it'll ask me to exit sleep mode and I'm like, yeah, thanks. But I haven't been able to figure out how to turn it off quickly. So that means I have to go into every single function one at a time and turn it back on. Pain in the butt. <laughs> All right, another thing you guys are gonna like this one, the pedometer. I don't understand why we can't get pedometers updated. So if you're going for a walk, it'll track that. But just these little bit of movements I'm doing, it's tracking that. It is way too sensitive. So maybe you're sitting at the computer, moving your hands around. I don't know what you're doing, but it's gonna track those as steps. So if you want to use this to track your steps, which I think is a good idea. A lot of people who struggle with weight loss and general health, you know, the experts still agree that we're supposed to get minimum 10,000 steps a day, all right? So what I would do is because it cheats, I would only wear it to go walking, running, or walking so that it only tracks my actual movement. Other than that, sometimes I'll get up to 20,000 steps a day and I'm like, what the hell did I do, man? And then I realize moving around in the car, doing stuff around the computer, um, fooling with my gear, it'll actually count those. But if I want to track distance and I hop on the ATV, it's not going to track that because my hands are fixed. We're connected to the satellites anyway. Why not just track our steps estimated on how we're actually moving? That's how it estimates the distance and everything off of the satellites. Uh, the pedometer function, it's going to be wacky. So one last complaint is when you're in stealth mode, you can't change connections, okay? and you can't change workouts. So if you're in stealth mode and you start a workout, you cannot leave stealth mode during that workout. You have to stop the workout or pause it, get out of stealth mode and come back in and vice versa. So that kind of bums me out because why does it matter? My workout's not gonna be going to my phone until I connect to it in the first place. So it shouldn't matter if I have stealth mode on or not. I should be able to play with that feature anytime I want. Now, as far as being grunt proof, well, it's a tactical sport watch. It's tough. I mean, I've beat the crap out of this thing over the last year and a half. All the positives definitely outweigh the negatives, but I'll tell you this, because of the solar function and how light and comfortable and functional it is, it's pretty pricey. I paid just about $4.99 for it over a year and a half ago. Updated price is on the screen for you. So if you're just looking to get some grids, um, maybe a little bit of navigation and sport tracking, you don't care about the solar, then you might want to just go to the lower models. You can get the Instinct 2 without solar, much cheaper. But of course, I shelled out that money because I wanted to test out the solar functionality. And for where we are with solar technology today, it's on point. It's about as good as it could be. So that's it, guys. This watch is absolutely grunt proof. I would not spend that money again, but the way this thing has been performing, I probably won't have to. So... Take that as you will. Thanks for joining me, and I'll see you in the next one. Out.